Since the myocardium is pitch black, this is likely an MRI sequence known as delayed gadolinium hyperenhancement. There are different cardiac MRI planes or views. One of the famous views is a short axis view where the left ventricle has a donut-like appearance. The delayed gadolinium enhancement view is done in a way where the normal myocardium should appear pitch black. Anything that appears white denotes that there is myocardial abnormality. On such an acquisition, myocardial brightness or enhancement is either due to edema, scar, or infiltrative disease. There are different imaging techniques to differentiate between edema, scar, or infiltration. However, the most important thing to know is the patient's clinical presentation. This is a patient who was known for having a remote myocardial infarction, and what we're assessing here is the location and the degree of myocardial scarring. Since myocardial enhancement may be due to ischemic or non-ischemic causes, it's important to differentiate between the patterns of enhancement to know which category this is. A small piece of important information is to know that the inner part of the myocardium is called endocardium, the middle part is mesocardium, and the outer part is epicardium. Since the coronary supply the myocardium from outside inside, the first areas to have ischemia and infarction are the inner parts, which is called the endocardium. So for enhancement to be ischemic in nature, it has to involve the endocardium and then it extends outwards. And this is what we see here. The other feature to be fulfilled for this to be ischemic in nature is that the abnormality should be contained within a known vascular territory. In this case, the apex is almost entirely involved, with extension of the abnormality to involve the anterior and septal parts of the mid and basal myocardium. One of the things that you could do today is to revise the vascular supply of the left ventricle by the different coronary arteries. If you do that, you'll notice that this is the LAD distribution. So this is a case of known postmyocardial infarction scarring in a left anterior descending coronary arterial distribution. Now, when a clinician sends a case with such a clinical scenario, he or she knows that this patient has MI. So what's the usefulness of doing the cardiac MRI? One of the major reasons to do such a study is to assess if this part of the myocardium is dysfunctional and if it could regain function after treatment. So the clinician needs to know if it's worth it to revascularize this area, meaning that by putting a stent or performing cabbage to that vessel isn't going to be of use. And this is what's called myocardial viability assessment by cardiac MRI. If the myocardium shows no enhancement or the enhancement is less than 50% of the myocardial thickness, this denotes likely viability. However, if enhancement involves more than 50% of the myocardial thickness or is transmural, such as what we see on this case, that means the myocardium is non-viable. So in this case, the features are consistent with non-viability in the LAD territory, and opening up the LAD vessel would be of no use. This is a nice correlation with the cine images on the same patient, showing that the areas that correspond to enhancement are not moving as well as the rest of the myocardium. In such case, revascularization of the LAD would mostly result in no difference with regards to the motion of the involved area, and this would not improve the patient's function. We learned today that there is a sequence on MR that's called delayed gadolinium hyperenhancement. We learned that there is a plane that's called a short axis plane, we also learned that delayed gadolinium hyperenhancement of the muscle denotes edema, infiltration, or scar. Importantly, we also learned that the ischemic pattern of enhancement should involve the subendocardium with various degrees of extension and should be contained within a known vascular territory. And finally, we learned that this kind of acquisition is acceptable as a form of assessing viability, and the golden rule is 50% of the myocardial thickness. This was a case with a bit of advanced imaging knowledge. Next cases would be a bit more simple. Thanks for watching. See you later. The abnormality is the presence of an L-defined opacity in the left retrocardiac area, which is a hidden area that you have to look at.
The general rule to remember is that the opacity on each side of the midline of a normal chest radiograph should be equal, especially in the retrocardiac regions. Another sign to keep an eye for is the silhouette sign. Notice how the hemidiaphragm is partially L-defined where you have the consolidation compared to the right side which is normal. On a normal lateral chest radiograph, the density over the spine should decrease as you go from a superior to an inferior direction. This is not the case on this patient. This is what's called a positive spine sign, denoting that the lower lobe, either on the right or on the left, has an abnormal opacity. This is an image on the same patient after treatment from his attack of pneumonia. Notice how the density in the retrocardiac regions are equal. There is no left retrocardiac opacity and the left hemidiaphragm is well defined. And this is a lateral chest radiograph on the same patient after treatment as well. Notice how the density over the spine decreases as you go from above below and this is the normal appearance. Teaching points from this case is that the density on each side of the midline should be equal, especially in the retrocardiac regions. There should be no silhouette sign affecting the hemidiaphragm. And a normal lateral chest radiograph demonstrates a decrease in density as you go from above below over the spine region. Thanks for watching. More cases later. There is a relatively well-defined and heterogeneous left frontal lesion, which is minimally hypo-intense on T1. The abnormality is predominantly iso-intense to gray matter on the T2 acquisition, and shows an iso-intensity to gray matter on flare as well. Whenever you face an intracranial mass, you have to decide if this is within the brain parenchyma known as intraaxial or outside the brain parenchyma known as extraaxial lesions. There are several signs of an extraaxial location with this abnormality. The first is that there is no significant surrounding edema despite the size of the lesion. The second is the buckling of the cortex inwards as if the abnormality is pushing the cortex instead of arising from within. The third sign is the presence of a CSF clift as appearing as a dark line here between the cortex and the abnormality. Finally, extraaxial lesions are commonly associated with adjacent dural thickening, what we call a dural tail. So let's re-identify all these signs on this coronal T2 image. First, there is no associated edema despite the size of the abnormality. Second, there is a surrounding CSF clift. Third, there is buckling of the cortex inwards. And finally, there is attachment to the dura. So all of these findings are consistent with an extraaxial abnormality. The most common extraaxial lesion in an adult is a meningioma, which this case represents. You might have noticed that the lesion has a relatively heterogeneous but high signal intensity on the diffusion weighted image corresponding to a relatively dark region on the ADC map. This appearance known as restricted diffusion is consistent with high cellularity, a feature that is known with meningiomas. Finally, after giving contrast, meningiomas are famous for showing intense enhancement, which we see here. Have you noticed the other lesion that enhances as well? Meningiomas are very common lesions, so don't be surprised to see multiple meningiomas in a patient even without neurofibromatosis. So teaching points from this case. First of all, you have to know how to differentiate between intraaxial and extraaxial lesion. It makes a major impact on your differential diagnosis. You also need to know about meningiomas. They're very common. They may be multiple. They have intense enhancement, various signal intensities, and they may be restricted on diffusion. Thanks for watching. There is a well-defined homogeneous nodule that projects over the right upper to mid lung. Note that uh, this lesion is sizable, but we still call it a nodule. The cutoff between calling a nodule and a mass on chest radiographs is three centimeters. If you have a single nodule, this is what we call a solitary pulmonary nodule, SPN. 
Now, lung nodules are very common and they have a very long list of differential diagnoses. It's very important to know the most common. The five most common reasons for seeing a solitary pulmonary nodule are a granuloma, carcinoma, metastasis, hamartoma, and carcinoid. Since this patient is a known heavy smoker, a chest CT was obtained. I will give you a chance to look at the chest CT and decide for yourself. The CT shows uh, chronic findings that are related to smoking. However, despite the size of the abnormality seen on the chest radiograph, there is no clear nodule within the right side. In addition to true intraparenchymal pulmonary nodules, nodular opacities on a chest x-ray may be extrinsic in nature. So you have to carefully look at extrinsic structures such as the pleura, the bones, and the soft tissues outside. Have you noticed this? This finding is more clear on the soft tissue window and it's obviously attached to the uh, cutaneous tissue. This is a skin tag that mimics a lung nodule on the chest radiograph. The teaching point from this case is to remember the five most common reasons for seeing a solitary pulmonary nodule and remember that some nodules may be extrinsic. Thanks for watching. There are several findings in this case. Let's concentrate on the hepatic findings and any finding that's related to that, starting by this unenhanced CT. Even without contrast, it's clear that the liver parenchyma has a heterogeneous appearance. In addition, there is extreme irregularity of the liver contour. Such a lumpy, bumpy appearance of the hepatic contour is very abnormal. A normal liver would have a very smooth margin. Notice as well that the hepatic uh, segments are shrunken and there is widening of the fissures. Classic liver cirrhosis is associated with atrophy of most of the segments with hypertrophy of segments 2, 3 and the caudate. With liver cirrhosis it's very important to assess for focal hepatic lesions. Although it's very difficult on this case but a keen eye might have noticed this bulge. The late arterial enhancement phase acquired about 30 to 35 seconds after injecting contrast is extremely important in assessing hepatic abnormalities. A good way to know that you're in the late arterial enhancement phase is to see good enhancement of the aorta and early enhancement of the portal vein. And as you see, the suspected abnormality seen on the pre-contrast acquisition is heterogeneously enhancing with areas of hypervascularity. Not only that, the lesion has new vascularity derived clearly from branches arising from the left hepatic artery. In general, hypervascular liver lesions could be benign or malignant. Benign conditions would include hemangioma, focal nodule hyperplasia, and adenoma. Malignant lesions would include hepatocellular carcinoma and hypervascular metastasis. However, a hypervascular lesion in a cirrhotic liver is a hepatocellular carcinoma till proven otherwise, which drives its supply from the hepatic artery. To complete our assessment, we have to check the portovenous and delayed phases. Before we go there, I'll drive your attention to these abnormal serpentine structures around the esophagus. This is the portovenous phase obtained usually about 70 seconds from injecting contrast and is denoted by the significant enhancement of the portal vein. Notice how the areas that were hypervascular on the arterial phase demonstrate hypodensities, signifying rapid washout of contrast. The combination of liver cirrhosis, 
hypervascularity on late arterial phase and rapid washout on the portovenous phase is consistent with HCC. Remember the serpentine abnormalities that we saw on the earlier phases? They show significant enhancement on the sportovenous acquisition. This type of enhancement denotes that these structures are venous in nature, consistent with varices secondary to portal hypertension. You could also appreciate submucosal enhancement of varices within the esophagus. Seeing this appearance, it's easily understandable why such patients present with bleeding. This was a nice case to discuss features of hepatocellular carcinoma, liver cirrhosis, varices, and to talk about different post-IV contrast phases. Thanks for watching. More cases later.